My name's Nicole and I work doing outreach for the film. Um, I'm gonna be the moderator of the panel today. I'm gonna handle the technical aspects of Zoom and also field questions from the audience. Um, first, I'm just gonna give some quick Zoom instructions um, so that everyone knows this panel is being recorded. To ask a question down at the bottom of your Zoom, you will see a Q&A box. Please place all questions and into the Q&A box. If you put your question in the chat box, it will probably get lost amidst the chat. Um, if your question is addressed to someone specific, please indicate who it's addressed to. If it's just a general question for anyone, I'll try to direct it to the appropriate person. Um, if you'd like to main, remain anonymous in the Q&A or the chat, please feel free to change your name on Zoom. To change your name, click on the participants button down at the bottom. Locate your name in the participants list. Hover over it or right click on it and select the option to rename yourself. When I'm reading questions to the panelists, I will not read anyone's name for anonymity purposes. Um, this recording of the discussion may be uploaded to the film's YouTube channel so that it is available to the public. That said, the chat and Q&A box contents will never be made public. Um, now I'd like to turn everything over to Lynn Cunningham, one of our filmmakers, so that she can introduce her, herself and she'll tell you who today's panelists are. While the panelists are introducing themselves, please go ahead and begin utilizing the Q&A box so that I can begin posing questions to the panel as soon as introductions are done. Lynn. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you everyone for joining us in the screening of this film. Um, Emma, you organized it, thank you so, so much. And um, Pam, thank you for joining us um, as well. I've seen some of your YouTube um, videos and I think you have so much wisdom. So anyway, it's gonna be a great discussion. One of our most favorite things about the film now is the discussion afterwards. So um, let us begin. Um, should I, do you think Nicole, I should go into the why of the film or? Yeah, sure. And then yeah, maybe okay. introduce everybody so, after. Yeah, so in um, the film um, about, oh, eight, more than six years ago, I was um, at a loss as to how to help a very struggling family member um, who had been a scholar athlete, um, highly functioning individual um, who sort of after graduating uh, from college hit a bad patch and one medicate one diagnosis led to another and and she was put on meds and 10 years later she was taking 10 meds a day and really not feeling um watching as all of her classmates were sort of excelling in her career in their careers and um i, I just was at a loss and i didn't know how to help this once very highly functioning person who was uh, so frustrated and so um, I knew I had to read I had to learn about what she was going through and the first book that I read was called Anatomy of an Epidemic by Robert Whitaker and um, it, it what I learned in that book just shocked me frankly and I knew I had to learn more and it really became the foundation for the film um, my filmmaking partner Wendy and I joined forces and together we interviewed hundreds of people across the country um, struggling with variations on, on the stories that you saw in the film. Um, all, every, every one of these stories moved us and made us, they sort of corroborated what Robert Whitaker had been saying in his, in his book. Um, and it was at that point that it became much less of a personal mission um, uh, to help my family member and more of a, oh my gosh, we, we have to get this word out because it's just simply a story that's not uh, being told. So we um, then interviewed experts and um, really built a great, great team. And um, the result has been you know six years of really hard work and 
as I said at the beginning, the, one of the best parts about it is that every time we screen the film, we learn more from people who question it, who push back, who agree, who share their own stories. And um, so it, it, you know, it has its own, every, every screening is different. And so it makes it really exciting. And thank you guys for joining and we can't wait to hear your questions. Lynn? Yes. Just for future, when you're talking, someone said if you could get a little closer, you might have been a little soft. Okay, okay. Okay, so um, now I guess everyone else on the panel will go and introduce themselves. Where did Pam go? I'm still here. Pam's there. Oh, I can't see her for some reason, but okay. <laughs> Emma, you want to introduce yourself? Okay. Um, my name is Emma Bragdon, and I'm the executive director of Integrative Mental Health for You, or IMHU.org. We are uh, online, and we're providing information about alternative, effective, um, al effective alternatives to the psychiatric drugs. I'm so deeply moved by this film; it's a little bit hard to talk cogently. Uh, so, so. Um, I've also had a, um, a history in my family of, of some s severe difficulties with mental health issues and real difficulties around reactions to medication. So this theme hits me personally, as well as um, hits me in a place where I've been deeply dedicated to get information out to the public, not just about the challenges of using uh, psychiatric medication and the necessity of really being careful and well informed, but really looking more specifically at the effective alternatives. So I just want to say there are ex very good alternatives. And, um, and unfortunately, if you Google about the alternatives, you, you may not come up with them very easily because Big Pharma has so much money put into its promotion. But um, we're out there. I'm one person. Pam is another. <laughs> There's lots of information out there. So um, thank you. Look, too long introduction, but I'm glad to be here. Pam, you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, so I'm Pam Shravanek, and I am a traditionally trained, um, an Ivy League trained psychiatrist um, who has become very alternative most recently in the past five years. I was an integrative doctor prior to that, but I've had such moving experiences with my patients over the two decades that I've been a psychiatrist. Um, and I've always seen my patients as wise, gifted people. My turnabout to really understanding what was going on with medication and people's issues in our society has reframed my entire view of everything. You know, my heart really went out to everyone in that film, um, especially you, Angela. I feel like the stories are the important thing because the people that we as psychiatrists don't realize we're affecting negatively. We're not taught that we're doing harm. I don't think people intend to do harm, but we're doing severe harm a lot of the time. You know, so I've dedicated my career now to exposing the truth. It has been um, an interesting road, but I feel really good about sharing these truths with people. So that no one has to go through what you've been through or anyone else in that film. It's so important to understand that people aren't broken. So there are so many, like Emma said, beautiful alternatives. You know, there's so many things why we're not well generally isn't due to the person. So it's just important that we shift this paradigm. And I think it's also very difficult to find the information because of Big Pharma and the way the media doesn't tell us all the stories. So I thank everyone for making this film. And I'm Angela Peacock. Um, since the film ended, I graduated with my master's in social work. 
and I did a 14 month internship as an outpatient mental health therapist. I worked with uh, refugees, immigrants, and asylum seekers and people that had no other access to healthcare. I never found a reason to diagnose someone or send them for, uh, you know, like treatment that was severe. Um, I just enjoyed being with people and listening to them. And um, I don't know. I just look forward to your questions and your comments. And thank you for joining us. So we'll get into the questions now. Um, the first one is for Lynn. Were those pharmaceutical ads that were shown that looked like they, they were from the 60s, were they real ads? Yes, they were absolutely real ads. It's such a fun part of making a film to be able to go back into archival footage and find stuff like that. But there were so many that we could have used and uh, one was better than the other, but we, yes, they were real. Um, all right, these questions are for Angie. Could you share your thoughts with us concerning the work of veterans advocating for psychedelic assisted therapies as a way of reducing and tapering for other substances such as alcohol and opioids, et cetera? And two, what are some peer-to-peer -peer mental health advocacy groups for veterans who are critical of traditional psychiatry? Those are excellent questions, wow. Uh, first, I wanna ask a question to your question, which is the thing that I always find, well, first of all, a statement that a lot of veterans are looking for alternatives, which is why a lot are now advocating for cannabis, MDMA, psilocybin, other kind of therapies because I think they have figured out the meds are not helping or they hurt me and I don't wanna take them anymore. So I'm looking for an alternative. So I think that's why there's been an explosion of these alternatives. But I always wanna ask the question, you know, yes, they might help some and you know, whoever, but why are we still running from the feelings that we have and looking for an escape? And, and I know some of them find those experiences to be transformative and I am like, go for it, totally go for it. I'm just weary that like now what I've learned through this experience is that the feelings are okay and that I just need help holding those memories and like processing the trauma. So I would just be weary of anything that's like taking you out of yourself, I think. That's just my personal view. Um, as far as tapering too fast though, I mean, I feel like that's, uh, I mean, should you use psychedelics to help you taper from substances? Maybe. I just know that I was in a state that if I would have put more um, substances on top of what I was already given, I don't think that would have turned out very well for me. So I would just be careful with mixing all those substances because we already don't know what they do, you know, and then to mix them, it just makes me nervous. Second question, what are some peer-to-peer -peer alternatives that are critical of psychiatry? I don't know yet. I'm still looking. <laughs> Not a lot are critical. Um, a lot know that there's a problem, we all know that there's 20 to 22 veterans a day that kill themselves. Um, and I, I suspect that a lot are medication involved. Um, there's yet to be any like retrospective analysis to find out what were these veterans taking at the time of their deaths. There's a bill in Congress that's been sitting there for like four years. I've been trying to push through a little bit from my angle, but um, I don't know. I think some offer a lot of alternatives. There's a lot of really good programs out there that just don't speak about the medication issues at all. They just will not touch it with a 10 foot pole. But as far as like us talking about this kind of stuff and being peer to peer, I don't know of any yet. I can only say Mad in America has a veterans part on their website. Oop, Nicole, Nicole you're sound is off. Sorry, thanks, Ange. Um, okay, this person says, wow, I cried through this whole thing. I considered myself a psychiatric survivor and have experienced what many of the people in this film experienced. I almost lost my life. One question I have is, how do you talk to loved ones who are lost in the narrative of chemical imbalance and pharmaceuticals, who are trusting of people who have done so much harm to so many. I find it so hard. I don't want to invalidate them, yet I'm so afraid for them. I just don't know how to help. Well, I- I'm a repan. Oh, okay, I, yeah, then. Well, I, I, just a quick answer, and then I'll defer to you guys who might be, have more expertise in it. But regarding my family member, I mean, that in and, of, in and of itself was an evolution for me because you can imagine when I started to learn 
what I learned in order to make the film. And just day after day, I would call her and just, uh, you know, beg her to um, read the books I was reading, etc. And I realized that 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 intense trying to convince someone something that they don't, if they're not there yet, it it isn't a good thing. And I think my advice would be to someone who has a family member you listen first, you listen to how they feel. I, I felt because once I started listening to her and she got really curious about what we were doing too. So the, um, no matter how enthusiastic you are about what you think someone you love should do, I think it's better to listen to what they're actually saying and, and learn from them. Anyway, that's a short answer, but. Lynn, I think maybe um, you could turn up your volume a little bit, then that might be the problem. <laughs> I, I love everything you said. No is, issue with that. Is it okay now, Emma? Yeah, yeah it's better. Okay, okay, okay. It's better. Um, can I just comment on that? I think it's a really slippery slope to know it, know something in your heart and to finally be able to see a truth, which neurologically, you know, cognitive dissonance is a thing where we can sort of see a truth here, but we can't compute it. And so what the human brain does, it just kind of throws it away because the brain is, is a simple program, you know, and spirit, there's other things, energy, there's all these things that come in, but the program is running as the program is running. Those people who start to inform themselves and are able to integrate all that will start to see a different thing. I agree with Lynn, we just have to listen because very quickly we can usually see, you know what, they're just not going to listen. They can't hear it. It's not that they don't want to know something that might help, but everyone's so different in our culture about what we're conditioned to believe. And it's, it's, it's so painful because, you know, once you see it, I think you just see it and it's hard to understand why others don't. So sometimes the best thing to do is to support someone, but also, you know, you can't deny your own truth. There aren't always easy solutions to things in life. And I think that's one of the problems that got us into this in psychiatry, that we're pathologizing just life. And, and so I just say, you know, hold that in your heart. And I always encourage everyone, cry as much as you can feel. It's, it's the joy of being alive. Joy isn't just happy. So I think that's a tough topic. And um, I have a lot of respect for people who go, I love you, I want this, because I see this and they have good data. But in my experience, a lot of, I get fired a lot because people's primary care doctors or oncologists say I'm harmful. It can be a very difficult position. I just wanted to say from a patient's perspective that when I was on the 18 medications at the same time, I did, it almost took away my ability to know there was something wrong with that. So it impairs you in such a way that you can't even hear you know, but I, but I also don't want to let, I don't want anyone to think that they shouldn't try because I mean, there's a part in the film where I say that and it's really painful for me to even watch myself say it, but just of all the times that I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what it was. And I kept going to the doctor and saying there's something wrong, but they kept telling me that it was the mental illness that was wrong, but I knew that something else was wrong, but I didn't know how to verbalize that. So I would say plant seeds when you can, but just know that we all have to come along our own way like when it's when it's time I guess I don't know I I'd like to put in my two cents here too <laughs> and just to say uh in brief I, I understood that the question is really coming from a position of if you're the one who's suffering and you want to go in a different way other than the mainstream then what can you do to inform your loved ones who really care about you and want the best for you and maybe advocating for a conventional treatment and um, I, I, I listened to what Lynn said in terms of her reading Anatomy of an Epidemic by Robert Whitaker, who was in the film. And I think that's a fantastic opening for, to uh, educate people about the questions that still remain in vis-a-vis um, -vis psychiatric meds. 
and that we really have insufficient data in terms of what happens to people long term. And he comes right, he's very well informed and he comes right out and says, in the long term, it appears that people will lose up to 20 years of their um, longevity, their lifespan, as well as long-term use can lead to, well, Angie, we've, we've seen about suicide, the possibility of suicide, but it's also systemic issues in the body. So this has been cataloged not only by Robert Whitaker. someone could say, well, Robert Whitaker's not a doctor. No, he's not a doctor, but he's really done his homework. And the other people in the film also have um, provide education. For instance, um, the doctor from, from Denmark, uh, Peter Gutsche, has some fabulous books. Dr. Peter Bregan puts out a um, multitude of videos. And um, the organization that I run, IMHU, we've, we have um, dedicated courses on the impact of psychiatric meds and what effective alternatives are out there. So I, it's, it's hard to say exactly what the recipe is to talk to your loved one about because people can have very strong feelings and they usually come from love and care. But there are um, things out there. And so people can get educated and you don't have to take it on yourself, especially if you're feeling vulnerable and confronting whatever inner demons you're confronting. <laughs> Okay, the next one. Hi, wow, what a great film. I was wondering what, or was there a turning point where medicated that you or others in your experience thought, I wanna get off of this stuff? Are there light bulb moments? Angie? Yeah, that would be me, I guess. Yeah, um, I would say I hit like a really deep bottom where I was pretty convinced I was gonna kill myself but I got really lucky and I got a psychiatrist and he, he took one list of my medication list and said, um, I'm a psychiatrist who doesn't believe in psychiatry and we need to get you off of a lot of these. So he took me from 18 down to like 10, which was like a good start. So then across those years, it took me like 10 years to get from 10 to zero. And the whole time it was just this curiosity in me that was like, who am I without all of this? Or what are my real feelings? Or I wonder what it would be like to not have to take these every day. And then toward the end, there was some like really hard moments where the waking up process was like, I was being shake, shaken, you know, like this is bad, like this is wrong, like what's happening to you? Like I kept getting new diagnoses. And as I was tapering my last drug, you know, he, the doctor would say, you have agitated depression and now I want you to take lithium. And I knew that that was not what I wanted to do. And then I started to get a little fearful, like, oh my God, they're going to put me on more meds and I'm trying to get off of them. And then the last moment was probably when I was extremely suicidal coming off the last drug because they were taking me off too fast, that I was greeted at the psych ward with a plastic wheelchair and two police officers. And I just thought like, something is really wrong with this. Like I'm here voluntarily. I'm not hurting myself or others. I'm just asking for help. And I... I don't know what's wrong and I'm in a crisis, but I don't even know how I got here. Cause I was so confused. Like, why am I feeling so suicidal, but I don't want to die. Like I was trying to graduate college at the time. So it was just like a really, a moment. Like I remember being wheeled down the hallway, like something is wrong with this. Like, this is how we treat people that are in crisis. I don't understand. So there's just these moments, you know, that was the curiosity of who am I? I want to be something more. I'm not my best self but I didn't know where that was going to end up. I didn't even really plan to come off of all meds. It just kind of happened that way. But definitely there's intuition. And I, I please listen to that if you have anything like that. Well, Angie, also, when we arrived at your apartment for the first time, I remember looking at your bookshelf and seeing so many books on the topic. Like you might've had these moments, but you did your homework. You started to. Well, that's funny you said that because I was talking about that I had this, this is a really weird spiritual experience. I'm so, I'm sure this is the right audience for it, but there was a moment in my apartment like 10 years ago or something where I was like, please God help me. I don't know what to do. And I had this like knowing to go look at my bookshelf and it was like, you already have all the books that you need. And when I went to the bookshelf, there was a book by Charles Whitfield that said, you may not be mentally ill. And there was another book by Dr. Peter Bregan called Toxic Psychiatry. 
And I had both these books on my bookshelf, but I never read either of them. But it was like the knowing was there, but I, I was so medicated, I couldn't even read. So it was there, I don't know. Um, so this one is probably for Pam. If you are in a professional role, what advice would you give to your patient when he or she asks if they should take SSRI that they are prescribed? Note that the patient is at risk to self, no self-harm or suicidal behavior, and others. I'm sorry to clarify, they are at risk to themselves or are not? It says, note that the individual is at risk to self, and then parentheses, no self-harm or suicidal behavior, and others. So they are at risk to self and others, but not suicidal or- That's confusing, because I don't, well, you know what? I am very alternative and I, I'll just be really, you know, I'm, I'm all about honesty, which people either love, you know, they either love it or they, they run the other way. Because the reality is when someone feels like they don't want to live, it's a real message. But I think um, you have to dig deeper. In one life, you can live many lives. So to me, it's a signal that you must change your life. And I feel we should support people in that as, as a psychiatrist. You know, we're also therapists, we're physicians, we're therapists. So for me, if someone's at risk, the very first thing we'll do, because I'm, I'm not sure is this person at risk or not, so we'll assume they're at risk because it's a confusing question. But we make sure that people are safe and we, we develop a plan with the family to keep them out of the hospital. This is how I, I treat people. The system is very broken. Um, I work really hard with families and people to get them healthy and to wean them off medications and, and I use compounding pharmacies and we go really slowly. The brain is a very delicate machine. Um, and if people end up in the hospital, they will be thrown back on medications so quickly and it's sort of like then we got to restart it all over again and it's so traumatic. So the first thing I do is to say, you know, how do we keep you out of there? I also, you know, I don't believe SSRIs or antidepressants do anything helpful in the long term. I think they can have a placebo effect at first. And I think that they can distance us ourselves as humans from our emotions. And when our emotions are so raw and painful and no one will allow us to share them and hold that so we can heal, then we just, it, it does feel good temporarily to just kind of, you know, get a little break, but that's not a solution. So I would always say, don't go on an SSRI. I don't think any of these medications are helpful. Most psychiatrists who are traditional would disagree with me, but that is just sort of my blanket answer. I don't believe people are broken. I think as a culture, we need to be very brave and make a lot of changes so that people don't feel like they're broken. I feel like in a broken culture, it's really easy to blame the individual. So I hope that answers the question. It was a little bit confusing. Pam, um, what are some of the alternatives that Pam and Emma work with? Well, I, <laughs> Pam, I, I have invited Pam to uh, teach uh, some courses at IMHU, and that's been a delight. One of the things she is, that's really strong um, in her knowledge base is nutrition and micronutrients. And so she teaches that particular course at IMHU, but I don't, I don't know, Pam, if you're also teaching it through your organization, Syntropy now, but um, I, I've certainly, uh, appreciated you offering your knowledge base through a, a course formula because sometimes people just can't spend you know three or four hours talking to a psychiatrist to get the knowledge base so I, I think that's that's one of the most um, Im central things that we all need to look at is what are we putting into our bodies and what kind of deficiencies might we have because the soil is deficient now and because there are so many environmental toxins um, 
and we could go on, but I won't go on on that particular theme. So I, I'll, I'll say that one of the things that's extremely important to me that informs a lot of the courses is that our spirituality can have a hugely powerful positive impact on our mental health. So that doesn't mean that people need to join a religious organization. It may be that people just need to learn a, um, some form of relaxation through mindfulness meditation. And that we may not even call that spirituality, but it touches people in a very, very deep way and allows them to move into themselves with more appreciation and some more objectivity so that they can um, not be completely identified if they have a negative feeling, completely identified with having to actually act it out or verbalize it or whatever. So um, especially for people who are having a lot of negative thoughts that they can't seem to get out of, mindfulness can be extremely powerful in terms of divorcing them from those habits of, thought, of thinking and relax the whole body. So mindfulness, nutrition, um, there are, uh, the, one of the courses Pam and I taught together was getting along if you're an empath, <laughs> some of the, the, uh, the things that we can, we can do uh, if we're especially sensitive people to get along in the world. So if you, uh, I just finished a course on um, uh, updating myself really on the effective alternatives for managing and overcoming depression. And I'm just astounded by what's, uh, what resources are really out there and that are quite accessible for people. So I won't go on longer than that. Um, I invite you all to go to imhu.org slash shop and take a look at the 34 courses we offer. I wanted to give you space, Pam, to answer too. <laughs> well, I, I obviously share a lot of Emma's um, views so I feel like I'm an educator at this point and the alternatives are about integrating all of these things that no one bothers to teach us as people, as healers. So the first thing is we have a human body. That's where I started. I'm a scientist who I'm very left brained. So we're a house of cells. What do your cells need and what's depleting those cells? And we have so many things like Emma's saying, you know, our soil is depleted of, of, of nutrients that we can't live without and even if you're eating a perfect organic diet you're not getting these nutrients we're you know radiation we're living in microwaves now you know we're being hit by that what does that do to our cells what does that do to our brains because our thoughts i feel are very you know attacked almost because if anyone ever sort of goes on an emf diet where if you can get out into the woods and not have a cell signal and not have any emf and you just do that for like 24 to 48 hours you can actually start to feel something really different and all of a sudden you just don't feel so bad right so there's all these things that to me we need to give people cultural changes and make them real and for me what i do in maine is i'm forming a community it's about forming community because these things are so hard to do alone. And oftentimes, like the other question we had earlier, family members, they love you. And I've had this personal experience myself when I had a physical illness and I decided to leave Mass General and heal on my own, um, which is how I got so alternative. And my, I, 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 my family members really thought, you know, I'd lost it and they weren't supportive, but it was out of love. So we have to find communities where we feel safe and then classes to, to go, what is energy? I teach people quantum physics and it's actually really simple because it's about intuition. You know, Angie has an amazing picture behind her that explains the universe. You know, there, you need to understand uh -huh. things that we, uh, in my opinion, we should be learning as kindergartners, first graders, second graders, meditation. Our mind is a tool, it isn't who we are. And processing emotions, will get you everywhere, you know? So there's so many, it's not just one thing. And, and that is truly what I believe in. You know, I, I run a company called Syntropy. It means coherence. We need to be coherent within ourselves and with others. And that's, that's how people heal. And the physical body can actually heal from anything. And 
I also just want to remind people that the brain and the body are one thing. You are not, you know, you can't just be mentally ill. Like if you don't feel well here, there's something wrong somewhere else. Take that stigma right away. So it's just about re-educating ourselves and then truly standing in our power and saying, you know what, society's broken. And instead of panicking about it, let's all change it. Next question is from a psychiatric nurse practitioner student who says, it's disturbing to me how little of this information is presented in the classroom. Side effects are discussed but minimized and we're told these drugs are safe to be on long term. Where do I go from here as a nurse practitioner when we live in such a med oriented society? Robert, Robert Whitaker has been invited to speak to um, medical school students as well as nurses. And there are a lot of YouTube videos, I think, that are out there of, of him speaking to those particular groups. So that might be an excellent p place to start for yourself, but also uh, to share with others, maybe other students who are, you know, you're studying with, but also maybe your professors. We would love to um, screen the film in nursing schools and um, have been in contact with University of Pennsylvania Nursing School. Um, the whole COVID thing has disrupted that, but we would love that. And if, if you um, reach out to us or email us or uh, through our, our medicating normal at gmail.com, we would um, at least how if you wanted to gather even 10 of your friends or colleagues, it would be, I think, worth it to just start a discussion. Yeah, and I just went through social work school and I took psychopharmacology on purpose so that I could get it on my transcript since I'm pretty self taught in this subject, but. Um, it's regularly perpetrated. I mean, I was so depressed about it thinking there's 287 social workers in my class and they're all being trained in the medical model. So I pushed back as much as I could. Other times I knew that I had to keep my mouth quiet. Um, it wasn't welcome most of the time. It's still written on WebMD that people have chemical imbalances. I mean, it's perpetrated, perpetrated through our society at all levels. So my advocacy now is like, one person at a time. So doing these screenings, I mean, there's 81 of you watching right now. So if 81 of us tells 81 of our friends, then that's a force multiplier. That's what we call it in the military. Like just tell another and another and another. And the thing we always like to say is like, don't believe us. We don't want you to believe anything we say. Go read, go do your own research, share a book with a friend, mail a book to a doctor, do whatever you have to do to, to combat this if you can, if you can help us. There's a lot of people getting hurt right now. And I just also want to encourage anyone in a student position, I tell my own children this, you know, what are you going to do with your life? And I, they see the way that I see the world because they're my children. And, you know, when my, one of my children started doing really well academically, I said, that is great because then if you, you know, as a child of two doctors, if you want to go in and be a doctor and then change the paradigm, that is beautiful. So, just remember, like you're saying, Angie, it is hard. They're not gonna like you speaking up, but know that, you know what? You just jump through those hoops and then you come out and you're, you're change agent. And you will save so many more lives by being that person that helps people wean. And, and you know, I'm, I'm a person who is very, you know, you can contact me. I am very open to any nursing student, anyone who, can prescribe something, how do you do it? How do you wean people safely? Um, I am so happy to share it. It is not that hard. If you're smart enough to be a nurse practitioner, this is super easy. I don't think schools are gonna put it in the curriculum now because they're connected to pharma, but don't feel like you're in the wrong place. You know, I, I just think that putting that seed in there and if you could get, yeah, 10 people to watch this, even if they don't agree, you know, I've always said to my children too, once you know something, you can't unknow it. So you may disagree, but it's always in there. You know, so I think it's wonderful what you're doing. It's very hard to have a realistic view as, as a student in any sort of medicine, but I think that's how we change the world. So I, I say, you know, keep going. Can I just add something real quick? I'm actually a physician assistant and I wanted to say that like going forward, 
from my experience, I'm a psychiatric survivor as well, so I'm both, that I would practice medicine completely <laughs> differently after having lived this experience. And you can provide informed consent to your patients, which is what most people are not getting. Um, and what survivors are saying all the time, like, I just wish I was told in the beginning what the risks were so that I could have made a decision if, if I wanted to take them or not. But most people say they weren't even told. Um, and on, I mean, I'm just looking at it right now on Amazon, there's a book by a, a physician named Dr. Stuart Shipko. It's called Dr. Shipko's Informed Consent for SSRI Antidepressants. So there are some existing resources that you can already have you know, made up. There's doctors that have posted their informed consent papers that they use and let their patients sign before even starting these medications. So it, sometimes it's, it's not so much like, no, you never prescribe them, but if you give the patients the information ahead of time, then you're really empowering them to make, to be their own best health advocates and to make truly informed health decisions. So. Can I add one more? thing on that on that note and that is I had so much respect for Pam uh, for Dr. Lemke in our film for Kelly Brogan in our film these are doctors who were trained uh, traditionally they went down that path um, we just actually interviewed someone today who kept asking questions in med school well why 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 anyway going down that path but being open enough and humble enough to say, wait a minute, maybe this isn't the right way. And, and as I said before, listening to their patients. And I, I think the courage to be on a professional track, uh, you know, a high powered, you know, highly respected professional track, and then to have the courage to change the way you're practicing. Um, you know, as a nurse practitioner, you can do that. And um, we will all respect you tremendously. And also get in the support groups and just be like an anonymous member and look at what the patients are saying are happening to them with their symptoms. That way you can identify what adverse effects from psychiatric meds look like and what withdrawal looks like. Because a lot of times, because there's no education, the nurse practitioners and physicians and PAs don't even know what they're seeing when it falls in their lap. So if you know that going in, you're gonna be so far ahead of everybody else. Um, okay, this one is for Lynn. I appreciate the film, but I'm new to these organizations just in the past few days, so I've not had time to research. What was the objective of creating this documentary? Was it just to raise awareness about the dangers of these drugs? Yes, primarily it was because it was a story. Now, we, I, I think that there are many perspectives on the story that we told. And um, we had to realize that we were telling a story for many people who knew a lot more than we did and for many people who knew a lot less. So our objective was to be super simple. There were so many different themes and things we couldn't address in the film because it's just so much to take on. And, uh, you know, even the concept concept of chemical imbalance and the history of that concept and the history of psychiatry it, it's just a lot to put into one film so we really really wanted to um, explain it in simple understandable terms but um, really to tell a story that we felt was not being told um, about psychiatry and there's so much emphasis on mental health in our society uh, especially campuses i have two college-age sons and the amount of kids, their friends, who are being, who are simply uneasy in school the way Dave Cope was, and they're uneasy. Of course they're uneasy. They're, they're taking too many courses. It's too pressured. And um, they go to the mental health department at their school, and they are medicated in, in a very short amount of time. And maybe eventually they, they do need meds, or maybe it is the right thing for them but certainly not at the rate at which it's happening and not without thinking about it or knowing about what you're getting into. And so it is absolutely, the film is to raise awareness and to allow people to start a dialogue. Even people that don't agree with us are very important in the dialogue. So yes, it's a, an awareness raising film, hopefully. Okay, the next person um, says, I'm 20 years old and I've come to notice that a big portion of, 
Oh, sorry, it moved. A big portion of teens and young adults my age are on a psych medication, if not multiple. And it seems to be getting worse in terms of pathologizing and commodifying normal human emotions. It's almost like there's a narrative being pushed that it's trendy to be mentally ill and have to take pills. This worries me because so far I've had three years of my life stolen by psych meds and I don't wanna to have to see people I'm close to have to go through that but I also don't want to invalidate anyone's mental health experience. But because of the increasing amount of people, especially young people being put on these meds, do you think it would make sense that there will be an inevitable public crisis that parallels the opioid epidemic? I think we're there, actually. I think we're there. We've been there for a long time. Um, that, that question made me really sad because just statistically, you know, all those people can't be broken. Our world is broken. And instead of feeling shame or fear, humans have done amazing things and we need to just do that. And so, you know, I don't know what else to say to that, but that's, it, that's hard and no one is, no one is broken. A 20 year old person is a, is a young person with an entire set of lifetimes to live in this lifetime. You know, they can't be broken. If they don't trip and fall, they never learn how to walk properly. So it's just, we have to change the paradigm and the way we live lives. No young person should ever feel like that. That makes me very sad. We had the uh, good fortune of being able to screen um, in a, at NYU, actually, and um, for a film class. And the film, it was just amazing because all the kids know exactly what Pam is talking about. They're all aware of the, the huge over-medication and um, almost everybody in the class had had an experience with medication. Um, but, but the actual, the teacher of the class was the warmest, most wonderful film teacher. and she said that what saddened her, which is sort of echoing what Pam is saying, was that she had been told by her mental health department that if any student in her class exhibited unease or being upset or anxiety in any way, that she was to go directly to them and notify them about the student. And, you know, she is a warm and kind, I mean, in, in my world, I would want to forge a relationship with my warm and kind and open-hearted teacher and not be told, not have that teacher go behind my back and tell the mental health department that there was a problem with me. So uh, it's, it is crazy what is happening out there and it, it's different on every campus, but there is a huge trendiness, I think. And uh, whoever asked that question, it was a great question because it's, it's a really huge problem. And I do agree with Pam. We are in it now, and with COVID, the, the, and maybe um, Emma brought this up earlier, but uh, rates of being uh, medications, antidepressants, and uh, anti-anxieties, we are reading that they have gone up hugely in this period that we're in right now, beyond the, what we already have, so. And suicide's gone up, is on a very steep incline as well. Yeah. And, and we're not being given the correct stats. It's much higher than the media even shows us. It's very concerning. It was my biggest concern the first day of this lockdown. I just, I just want to add a couple things to that um, question comment. It was so good. But just that, yeah, I've noticed that when I started to share my experience of being harmed, like I was getting so much pushback, but I was like, wait, I'm just telling my story. Like what I'm not telling you to do anything. I'm just saying that I was hurt by meds, you know? So there's a stigma. There's this narrative that there's stigma in seeking mental health services, but there's also a stigma to say that, you know, I was harmed by meds. I was harmed by the mental health care system. I came off and I'm trying to do better by myself. They almost, there's, there's like a tendency to say, well, like you're not bad enough or you weren't severe. You know, I get, I get so much pushback, not even from like the film screenings, just from like being in social work school and talking about my personal experience. So not only is there a narrative that we all need help and you need to seek help from a professional. And if you're suicidal, you need to call a 1-800 number. Like there's all these messages that people are getting that I think are pulling us away from each other, that we really need to turn toward each other, not 
towards professionals, towards like all this help. And, and that's not to say that we don't have real problems with living and real problems in our lives and context and, you know, but I don't know. I just wish the narrative were different that we were bringing each other together, you know? And then also the second thing I was thinking was um, this pill shaming thing. Like if you talk about this in any way without supporting the mainstream narrative that meds help, that you need to seek help from a professional. If you speak against that in any way, it's seen as like this pill shaming thing. But I liked what Emma said at the beginning that like, we're not telling anybody to do anything. It's just, this is information that we should all have. Like, I wish I would have had it before I started down this path. You know, I lost 15 years of my life to medication side effects and like healing from that. It's not a little thing. It's like half of the time I've been on this planet almost. So I don't know. I just think there's competing narratives and we really need to open our hearts to other people's experiences and the harm that's happening in the name of help, you know. I, I, I just want to say a little bit, I agree with what Angie, what you, what you just said, and that, that uh, sincere connection is maybe something that people are longing for more than anything else. And going to see a professional, even though it's a wonderful professional, <laughs> may not actually satisfy that desire for, for connection. And um, so on that note, I just want to say that, yes, 20-year-olds um, generally have ups and downs, and that's part of being 20 years old and just facing all the questions, ex um, existential questions of life that usually go through us around 20. But we are in an extraordinary time right now, too. And it would make sense, absolute sense, for people to be extremely sad and extremely scared because of, the, of what's going on in the world right now. And, and um, I don't think that psych meds are the answer to that, you know, be, uh, our situation in the world. Our answer comes more from connection here, and we can do it through Zoom. We can't do it through um, sitting down with each other as, as well and being safe. But... But um, we need the connection and we need to start looking at different paradigms, not only in mental health, but how we're living in the world. And my heart goes out to people in the, in the younger generations. I have two grandchildren who are teenagers. And I, I think that period of time between 13 and 25 is just gonna be extremely difficult for the kids who are going through that right now because of what's going on in the world. So I, I just my uh, what's the answer? What's the quick answer? I don't know exactly, but uh, there are these alternatives to uh, to that are very effective in terms of assisting us to to get more stabilized within ourselves and appreciate ourselves and have connection with the deepest self in ways that can really promote uh, a feeling of trust that things are going to be okay. It may not happen tomorrow, but things are going to be okay, and we can connect authentically with each other, and that's a tremendous drug, connection. <laughs> well, yes, that's the drug we can use, C community, real community, and I encourage everyone, wherever you are in this world, form it yourself because, you know, it isn't easy, but that is the solution. It truly is, no one is broken. In fact, if you are feeling deeply, you have gifts you're uncovering. So I just encourage people to really, you know, Buddha said, question everything, even what I tell you. Many people might not be Buddhist, but I don't think people think that wasn't a wise, you know, piece of advice. I just really want people to take their power back. All right, a kind of a double header for Angie here. Is there a resource to go for how to go about withdrawal, any trusted source based on empirical evidence as opposed to anecdotal? This person is asking as a researcher and wanting to know what could be done to help. And then the second part is someone who's been on Ativan for 20 years and Clonopin since 2008. They're in tolerance withdrawal. What can they do? And they're also on some Depakote as well. So some, maybe some resources for that person. So if you go to our website, 
um, we have a resource tab with alternatives, a reading list, and websites, and even there's a few therapists and coaches on there. Um, I'm sure Pam can talk about the tapering guidance um, per se, but I will say that um, I'm so glad I can say this with because I'm not licensed. It's awesome <laughs> that um, there's a because the medical field kind of left the building on the topic of you know safe deprescribing so far. There's a whole lot of lay evidence that's, you know, like 40 years of people coming off meds and they just pass these, you know, thank God for the internet because I'd be dead without it. But um, so there's some websites like Benzo Buddies Support Forum, there's survivingantidepressants.com. The one that Nicole helped co-found is called The Withdrawal Project. And it take I mean, it takes you step by step. It's a lot of reading and it's better if you have somebody in your life that can help you with that. But um Unfortunately, because so, I mean, and I've watched in four and a half years, I've probably watched 20,000 people either come into a group and say, oh my God, help me. My doc, my doctor just cold turkeyed me off. Or I think my meds are making me sick. How do I get off of these things? And literally watch this peer to peer support, help support each other. And a lot of people taper at home. And that's a very controversial thing to say, but that's just how little the medical establishment takes this seriously and that not everybody can come off overnight the next day. In fact, it's dangerous. It almost cost me my life because my doctor did that to me. So I would just like strongly suggest you read all you can from the lay community and you have your own discernment to figure out what is best for you because ultimately it's your body. It's gonna be your withdrawal experience and you're the one who has to weather the symptoms and decide if you even, maybe you don't wanna come all the way off. There's also Will Hall wrote a harm reduction guide to tapering psychiatric drugs. That's an excellent resource um, as far as like research in print, Nicole might be able to help me answer that, but I would say look at Mark Horowitz. If you do a like literature search, Mark Horowitz antidepressants, he actually proved that what the lay community says is correct. And then there's also another article, Joseph Witt During on Psychiatric Times wrote about what we can learn from the online communities. So basically like our advice is actually evidence-based, but in a different kind of way. And then I forgot what, those, what was the second question, just benzos and how do you get off, what was it? Yeah, um, been on benzos a long time, intolerance, also on Depakote, what can, what can they do? Yeah, just, I would just read, 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 inform yourself, decide your own taper plan. You can, what I do is when I, and I tell other people this, is I always ask a, a very open-ended question to a new doctor. So I even tried to go to functional medicine to like ask, cause I knew they were more alternative. So I would just ask like, what do you know about people being harmed by benzodiazepines? Or what do you know about tapering an antidepressant? And then I just shut up and I wait until see what they say because what they answer, if they're really defensive, that means they don't, they don't know anything. If they say things like Pam says, I use a compounding pharmacy, you better pay that one extra because they know what they're talking about, you know? So like there's certain questions you can ask if you want a doctor to help you, but if you can't find a doctor, like I said, you, you have to read and do your best, best medical, like you teach yourself how to be your own psychopharmacologist. It's terrible and scary. And I can't believe this is like the state we're in, but Patients are tapering themselves off because doctors will not help. That's just the fact of the matter. So, you know, I'm just going to jump in here. So this is literally what I do. Um, I don't take insurance because I will not participate in a broken system. I will, you know, I'm not going to sign up as a provider and do what they say because I, I, I took a, an oath to do no harm. Um, you know, I have a situation where I do tons of telepsych all over the world. Um, not just in this country. I can only prescribe in this country, but that is what I do. So Depakote and two benzos, um, you know, that's not hard. We go one at a time. We go slow. Sometimes it'll take me two years to get people off meds or more. You know, a typical wean for me, for someone, um, it depends also on their age and their circumstance, but I'll go maybe 0.1 milligram of clonazepam every two to four weeks. And if they're on it three times a day, I'm only gonna do it, you know, I'll start in the morning, you know, when people should be more alert. I go very slowly and as we do that, we, we boost up, you know, your health. We talk about nutrition. We talk about, you know, everyone who's ever been depressed or anxious to a state where it becomes intolerable, it needs zinc and B6. You know, there's just some simple stuff. Um, you know, and I, I'm open to being very creative. If I had enough people to do an online group, as long as people, you know, I don't trust the internet as long, even though 
you know, supposedly, you know, Zoom is HIPAA compliant. You know, I just always tell people, remember, I don't know where this is really going to go because especially now, not everyone can come to Maine every week, but you know, I'm always open to making it affordable. You know, we have so many people on a sliding scale. It, it concerns me that people would have to withdraw on their own. And I've heard a million stories like it and my heart goes out. So, you know, even if I don't have a solution, I really would say I'd like to pride myself in being just a human, we'll figure it out, you know. And you can go to my website, centropyglobal.com, um, just contact us. If we get enough people, even 10 people who want to do a group once a week, you know, that's really affordable out of pocket. You know, that's re and because it's just, it's not, you don't know what you don't know. And, and Angie, I think you're remarkable. It's so hard to read when you're on all those meds. It's like, it's so difficult. Your poor brain, yeah. you know, so I feel like, as, isn't that why I went to med? To med school right so i mean I, I definitely want to say i wish i knew more physicians like me i know kelly brogan is extremely similar in her view um i don't know how accessible she is you know she does other things but for now especially because of covid um because i was really doing a lot of speaking i'm really honing in on like what do people need so it is an actually an interesting time even if you want to throw us an email, I hate to see anyone doing this themselves. I don't think it's safe. Um, I go very slowly. You know, I respect people's brains, bodies, experiences. It's, it's tough. So, but so many people are successful and do it themselves. Um, but that's, you know, we shouldn't have to be doing everything in such a difficult manner. It's, it's really concerning to me. Yeah. I think it's really important too for, for people who are tapering to recognize that there are some micronutrients that they can use while they're tapering and it really helps them have fewer side effects, but that's unique to each person. So having, having someone to supervise who is knowledgeable about micronutrients and how to ease the path can be so helpful and yet it, it's not so easy to find. Um, orthomolecular psychiatry is, is really the, the best place to look, but there aren't so many molecular, orthomolecular psychiatrists around. And that is, that is something that I do. Um, so even if you can't afford the labs, because a lot of people don't have insurance or can't paper it out of pocket, there are stuff we can figure out there. You know, it's just, it's, I, you, anyone could do it on their own, but I think that'd be phenomenally difficult. And then I also do like, you know, support is, is really important just to know this isn't your fault, but this isn't right. No one could possibly be this broken. So, um, you know, it's just yeah. something, something for people to think about. Yeah, also that I was just gonna say that part of coming off process was learning that there wasn't a pill to take it away or there wasn't a doctor to go see and part of the problem is that you like for me I handed my body over and I was a patient and like that was my identity is I can't I'll, I will never forget the last day I took a medication like it was like I don't know what to do I've done this for 13 years every day and, and even taking pills every day teaches you something about yourself mm -hmm. subtle you know you get these messages that there's something wrong with you so part of the waking up process is also realizing that like this is my body and I have to take control of this and I'm the one that's going to suffer I have to do what's best for me with a doctor or without you know it's a really hard truth to learn it's I mean I'm still sad about it and like the coronavirus stuff has really kind of re-traumatized me because I'm like oh my god what if I need a doctor like I don't want to you know I'd rather die <laughs> so it's just yeah um so we are running low on time, which is sad because there's a lot of great questions, but it sounds like um, Emma and Pam are available to people after. So if your question didn't get answered, um, perhaps you can reach out and also we're available at the film too, so you can get in touch with us. Um, the last question I'm gonna give to Lynn. Um, you get kind of a double header too. It's the typical questions of like when, um, is the film going to be available to the public? Um, 
On top of that, someone wants to know, when did this filming take place and has anyone been in touch with the other participants in the film to see how they're doing now since the filming finished? I really hope everyone's doing okay. Um, the film is, um, we're, we're in the process right now of just having um, made an agreement with the international distributor. So um, it will be distributed internationally, globally, um, um, probably starting in the fall. And that will be a 52 minute version of the film, which is painful cutting, cutting it down from 76 to 52. But um, so that's, that's in the works. Um, with our longer film, we are really, really trying to crank on these community screenings. And so I ask all of you to reach out if you know of any organization or group of people who are interested in learning about this, talking about it. Um, we, our screenings range from uh, really 10 people to how many, what's our largest screening, Nicole? 460. Right, right. Yeah. And um, it's really too bad that, it, that we all it has to all be virtual because in the very beginning when we were doing the film festivals, having living people, as Emma or it was Pam talking about the power of community and people, real audiences and people connecting with each other, we really miss that and we can't wait to get back to that. But that's our, then, then this fall, we hope to also um, engage in US educational distribution because that's, a, that's an area that really matters. Um, to get it into the schools and universities and med schools. And then after all of that, um, we will eventually have it on our website for sale and um, hopefully maybe even a broadcast. PBS maybe will air it. So um, we'll see. All of that you can find out and follow us on our website, which is medicatingnormal.com. Um, and then there was another part of the question. Uh, when were these people, when were the characters filmed and how are they doing? Yes. The characters we, we did, uh, yeah, it was about six years ago that we, we started researching and meeting everybody. And yes, we keep in touch with all of our subjects um, our, and our experts too. So um, from time to time, expert, our subjects and our experts join us on panels. Angie is leading the way on that. Um, because our other subjects are sort of shyer in public um, arenas, but they have joined us too, and everyone is doing well. Um, I want to say sadly that uh, Tabita um, Green, who was Rebecca's mother, just died sadly of uh, pancreatic cancer, and that's was really really sad because she was the mom who took it upon herself when her daughter was diagnosed, and she knew something was wrong. She just would not. She kept educating herself by reading and um, questioning. And um, I think Rebecca is doing as well as she is because of her mom. So it's a huge loss to not have to be tough. But anyway, thank you. Thank you guys for joining us. This was a great screening and um, you know, keep learning. So now um, we're at the part where we're going to close and we're going to give Emma and Pam a chance to um, just share uh, how they can be contacted, their websites, any information about their organizations they would like to share. And then Angie's going to close with a little more information about the film and then we will wrap it up for this evening. Okay, um, I, as I mentioned, I'm the executive director of Integrative Mental Health for You. And just to abbreviate that, think of the words I'm human and, and uh, the first four letters are I-M-H-U <laughs> and I'm human. So um, that's one way to remember it. We're a not-for-profit not organization. We are completely independent of any kind of sponsors or um, business and uh, we are financially struggling right now because we really look to registrations and contributions to keep our doors open. So if, if you are in a position to make a contribution um, towards uh, IMHU, please go to imhu.org forward slash contributions, plural. That would be great. And I, I'm just absolutely thrilled that that such a fine film is available now to some degree, but will be to really more available. 
it's such a contribution to the field. And I want, just want to formally thank Lynn for putting it out there, you know, and, and your whole team for doing everything that's necessary to put a film together. It's no small thing and you've done a beautiful job. And, and Angie, it's been such a pleasure to hear what you had to say and you're being so straightforward about your story and so present. And uh, Pam, you know, I'm a great admirer of your work. And so thank you for showing up at our invitation. It's a pleasure to have you with us. And Nicole, thanks for the great job moderating. Wish you well, yeah. So I work out of Portland, Maine um, at an organization called Centropy Global that is actually, it's, it's sort of my mission uh, to form a community of like-minded people to change the world. It's owned by my fiance and I. Um, it is all independently funded. It, it is truly my life purpose. You know, I, I really just want to pay forward what I learned on my own self-healing journey. Um, and like I said, before you can reach us at Syntropy, which is S-Y-N-T-R-O-P-Y global.com. And just, you can go to the contact me part and, you know, tell us what you need. We are creating what people need. It has really shifted with COVID. So as a psychiatrist, um, my concern truly is, it always was prior to this about community, but we really would be happy to respond to whatever we can for people's needs. Uh, I really want to help people. This is such an important film. I was so moved when I watched this movie the first time. Um, this, is, this is what needs to happen. We need to flip this. We need to show people People aren't broken, but look what we ever, look what we're doing. And I'm not trying to accuse the medical field, but I want people to really know you can be okay. I would like to help in whatever way I can. Contact us, let us know. Um, you know, it's about education. It's about community. It's about just reframing the world. So let me know. I, I also see people individually. Um, I've always done telepsych because I have a unique point of view. There's not a lot of people like me. So that was pretty common to me before this. Obviously, I enjoy people in person the most. But, you know, we'll get back to that hopefully pretty soon. But I, you know, my heart goes out to humans. So don't assume you can't afford it. If there's enough people who say, this is all I can pay, we can start a group. I just would love to hear from people because films like this show me, there are people who want to do this, you know, and there's so much we can learn and together as humans and shift. So again, it's Centropy Global and, you know, I hope to hear from lots of people. And my heart goes out to everyone who this has touched because no one is broken and we can't keep pathologizing people. So thank you everyone. Thank you for making the movie. Angie, my heart really goes out to you because I think war is traumatic, but this was just as traumatic. You know, this is important. So thank you for being brave. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just say that um, we have a YouTube channel that every Friday a new clip is released that, that supplements or complements the film. So there's over 100 clips on the YouTube channel if you search for Medicating Normal. And if you subscribe and like all the videos, that helps us. There's also uh, all social media channels. We post an article a day so you could get a free education in all these topics and read all about um, these topics right there when you open your Facebook. And uh, you, there's more ways to watch the film. If you go to medicatingnormal.com, just click on watch the film. There's another screening next week. So if you want to tell your friends to go, you must watch this movie, you can send them the link that way. And I think that's it, right? Did I get everything? Yeah. And I just, I'll just say lastly, um, if you're struggling with anything, the pain is deep, but it means that you're human. And I would just invite you to hang on to your support system, find a healing buddy to help you through this. 
and then it's just okay to feel everything even though it's a scary earth that we live on you know it's okay it's gonna be okay one more thing for me, if the Benzo person who asked the question is still listening, we forgot a really good resource for you. It's called the Ashton Manual. Um, and if you just Google that, you can find it online and it's great advice for tapering based on a clinic that was real life um, Benzo patients who were tapered by a really wonderful physician who took the Benzo cause on and made this great manual to guide people in tapering. So. Um, I think with that, we are going to close and um, say goodbye. Oh, Lynn, you're muted. We oh, can't hear you, Lynn. You I just wanted to say thank you, um, Emma, for reminding us about our humanity, Pam, for proving that psychiatry can be reformed from within, um, Angie and Nicole, I don't know if everyone knows what a big role you guys, are. I mean, Angie, obviously you played a role in the film and that was incredible and courageous and articulate and really um, we're all indebted to you for that but Angie and Nicole now are really uh, on the front lines of the outreach of this film and um, I have huge huge um, gratefulness for both of them they are they do not give up they do not take no for an answer they are um, organized um, compassionate curious and it is a joy to work with them and we have a fantastic team. This film would never have been made with, I, I could go into 20 people who've added to at various stages of it. But um, anyway, right now, Angie and Nicole, you guys are leading the charge and thank you. And thank you to our audience tonight too. Yeah.